One of the things that I miss <clears throat> when I teach at this time uh, that I get to have when I teach Sunday school or the evening messages, I don't get to have much interaction with the uh, people that I'm talking to. And it makes it difficult to know how much is really being communicated and how much of it isn't. And so I wanted to have a question and answer time after my message just so that we could interact and have fellowship with one another. And I know people are generally um, hungry after noon or 12.30, so <clears throat> we decided to make it uh, a meal and some um, question and answer. Uh, those of you who have plans and can't be here, that's understood, but those of you who have the excuse you didn't bring anything have no excuse. There's plenty of food. There's two chickens and a roast and potatoes and carrots and cowboy cookies and pumpkin muffins. <laughs> so you're not free to leave unless you had plans already. Please come, feel free to partake. My family cannot eat all that uh, anymore. <laughs> they probably used to, but not anymore. So uh, please, um, Please feel free to attend um, and uh, participate in the uh, fellowship time. I think there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot. All right, if I remember, I'll bring it back up. All right, let me uh, ask the Lord's blessing on our time in this word. Father, we thank you for your truth, and we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts and renew our minds, that we would understand the truth that is here. We pray your spirit would be our teacher and that our hearts would be prepared to receive your truth so that it would bring forth abundant fruit for your honor and for your glory. We thank you for the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his willingness to humble himself and to become a man and to offer himself as a substitute for us. We thank you that he became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. We thank you that you in power and in grace and mercy raised him from the dead and have appointed a day when you will judge the whole world through him, having furnished proof through his resurrection. We thank you that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through him, and that that is clearly evident because of his resurrection. We thank you that you have given us of your grace, that you have given us the faith necessary to believe, that you have given us the, the Messiah, the Christ, in order to believe in him. We thank you for your scriptures. We thank you for the blessings that are abundantly ours. And we pray that we would honor you in everything we think, say, and do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Non sequitur. Some of you may know that term, some of you may not. But like the term sounds like, sequitur, sequence, numbered, in order. Non sequitur means something that's out of order, something that came up that you weren't looking for. It doesn't make any sense. It does not follow. Well, I was looking at my outline last time I spoke, and I looked at some of the applications, and I said, how did I come up with that? And to me, it was a non sequitur. I don't know what I was doing. But uh, at the time, it made sense, but I, I don't know if it made sense to you, so I'm going to... Uh, review just for a second what I said and make sure that I wasn't misunderstood. One of the things I mentioned was generational worship, and I, I did not mean to imply that we should bring in all manner of differences and um, um, changes in, in what we do here at Grace Bible Chapel. That wasn't my intent at all. What I was trying to say was 
there are individuals who have a different preference, if you will, in the way singing is done and in that kind of worship. And all I was trying to say was, if it's a preference for them and not a preference for us, we should not stand in judgment of one another because that would be legalistic, saying that our way is the right way when I can't find our way in the scripture, so to speak. Nevertheless, worship these days has deteriorated in general. There's more time given to singing and less time given to the preaching of the Bible. And as much as singing is important, and Martin Luther certainly thought preach, uh, singing was important, I think he thought the Bible was even more important. I think sometimes we get ourselves almost in a hypnotic trance state rather than really thinking about what we're singing. And I have a real hard time with the guy who leads the singing being called the worship leader. I would think the guy teaching the Bible is the worship leader. Because without the truth of the word of God, you have no worship, regardless of what songs you sing. So I wasn't throwing everything away or everything into one pot and saying everything's good. I wasn't trying to say that at all. But I am saying that there are people who genuinely worship God, and it's slightly different than the way we do. As a particular example, uh, if, those, if some of y'all attended the conference we held here, there were people who sang different songs, used different instruments, had a different style. And I think we accepted that perfectly well, and I think we should. And then there was another thing, and I don't even, I wasn't even sure what I meant by this, but it was uh, something about the teaching of the modern church. And I think I finally figured out what I was talking about. <laughs> it has to do with name calling and, and accusing people of believing things that they don't necessarily believe, but because they said something, it makes you think they believe something else. And the example I'm going to use is the uh, contemporary fight concerning lordship salvation. Now, if I were to ask you what lordship salvation means, I'm pretty sure there's some of you don't even know what it means. And I think there are some of you who probably uh, understand it in the wrong way. I'm not sure I know what it means. Because people accuse others of one thing, and I know they don't believe that. And they accuse somebody else of something else, and I know they don't believe that. But if somebody is teaching a person is saved by grace alone. He might be accused of not including the truth, yes, but faith without works is dead. And somebody who is harping on faith without works is dead may be accused of teaching salvation by works. And they might be correct but they might be entirely wrong. Let me read you a quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones. And for those of you who are into these debates, Lloyd-Jones would certainly have been a lordship salvation individual, believing that a man who is truly saved cannot have a lifestyle that doesn't relate to God. That makes no sense. A person who is genuinely saved will walk in righteousness. Maybe not perfectly, certainly not perfectly, but he certainly will walk in righteousness. But notice what he says on the front of your, on the first page of your inside bulletin. If it is true that where sin abounded, grace has much more abounded, well then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound yet further? 
Doesn't that make sense? That if grace abounds where sin abounds, let's sin all we can so grace will be bigger. That sort of makes sense. Of course, Paul said, Meganoita, may it never be. But on the second page, look what Lloyd-Jones says. First of all, let me make a comment. To me, a very important and vital comment. The true preaching of the gospel of salvation by grace alone always leads to the possibility of this charge being brought against it. There is no better test as to whether a man is really preaching the New Testament gospel of salvation than this, that some people might misunderstand it and misinterpret it to mean that it really amounts to this, that because you are saved by grace alone, it does not matter at all what you do. You can go on sinning as much as you like because it will redound all, to the, all the more to the glory of grace. That is my comment, and it is a very important comment for preachers. I would say to all preachers, if your preaching of salvation has not been misunderstood in that way, then you'd better examine your sermons again. And you'd better make sure that you are really preaching the salvation that is offered in the New Testament to the ungodly, to the sinner, to those who are dead in trespasses and sins, to those who are enemies of God. There is this kind of dangerous element about the true presentation of the doctrine of salvation. When you tell people that salvation is offered to the enemies of God, to the guilty, to the ungodly, to the sinners, to the dead in trespasses, and it is absolutely free. They owe nothing. You're going to be misunderstood. And if you're not misunderstood, then you haven't preached grace. Because grace will be misunderstood. This, there is this kind of dangerous element about the true presentation of the doctrine of salvation. Paul was misunderstood. He was called an antinomian. The Jews of his day said this man preaches against Moses and the law. And he didn't. He did not preach against Moses and the law. He preached the truth about Moses and the law, but he never preached against it. But because he was so adamant in his teaching, he was accused falsely. So let's look at Galatians chapter 2 and some comments that Paul has made. And you know the Apostle Paul. You know he's not preaching against the law. But maybe you don't know me that well, so let me try to put it in this context. If I said, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Why, we're Americans. We're justified by being citizens of the United States. We are a Christian nation. God has blessed us. No. No, he hasn't. Whoa, that brought up some ears right. No, he hasn't. We are justified by faith in Christ Jesus, not because we're a blessed nation. Now, because you could be misunderstood, you have to say the other side as well. 
Yes, God has blessed us. Lest you think I don't believe he has. But it is not because God has blessed us that we are blessed. We are blessed through faith in Christ alone. What if I were to say something like Galatians 2.19, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I no longer follow the law. I follow after God. You would probably think something was wrong with me. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Now, most of you would probably agree with that, unless you were a legalist or a Pharisee. What about Galatians 3, 2? This is the one thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Do you receive the Spirit by works of the law? No. Galatians 3, 5, So then does he who provides you with the Spirit and work miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Not by works of the law. Well, Paul, you seem to be down on the law. <laughs> 3.8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then it is those who are of faith who are blessed with Abraham the believer. You're kidding me. It is because you are a Jew that you are blessed with Abraham the believer. No. It is because you are of faith that you are blessed with Abraham the believer. Jews wouldn't have liked that at all. They had Paul sent to Rome as a prisoner because of that. Galatians 3.11, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. And what about verse 12? Now the law is not of faith. And then Galatians 3, 15 through 18, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say into seeds is referring to many, but rather to one and to your seed that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. It doesn't. The law comes in and it doesn't nullify the promise. Verse 19, why the law then? Paul, you've confused me greatly. You've told me the law can't give me the spirit. The law can't work miracles among, me, among us. The law can't uh, make me a child of Abraham. The law can't do anything. So why do we have it? Paul says it was added because of transgressions. Oh, okay, I got it. It was added because people sinned and God wanted to curb their sin. We can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and somewhat see that. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul's goal of his instruction is love, but some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussions, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person. Did you know that? That the law is not for a righteous person? But for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men, and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. The law was made for unrighteous men. But you know what? If someone wants to be a liar, telling them lying is a sin doesn't do a bit of good because they don't have a heart 
to tell the truth. And if someone is a murderer, do you think the murderers who kill people in the United States of America, do you think they know there's a law against murder? Yes, does that stop them? No. The law can't stop anybody's heart from doing what they want to do. So why do we have laws against murder if it can't stop them? Well, if we find them, we put them in jail so they'll stop it. But we can't change their heart through the law. You cannot legislate righteousness. You can only legislate what is sinful. So does the law really prevent evil deeds? What nation had the law? Israel. Did that prevent them from doing evil deeds? No. They knew not to intermarry with the foreigners and adopt their pagan idols. They knew that. And if they would have forgotten, God sent them a prophet time and time and time again to tell them what you're doing is wrong. Did that change them? No. But what about Romans chapter 5 where Lloyd-Jones was in his quote? Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. The law came in so that transgression would increase. Do you understand what that's saying? It's saying that there are laws so that people violate them more often. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law came in so that I would sin more? Turn to Romans chapter 7. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. I didn't even know coveting was wrong. But when I found out it was wrong, I coveted all the time. It was always humorous and yet disappointing. When I was teaching in the Christian school, when chapel was first thing in the morning, and the person in chapel gave a message, had an application, and the first sin of the day that went to Mr. Rare's office was what the chapel message was about. The teaching that you're not supposed to do this, that you're supposed to do this, stirred up within the children the desire to disobey it. So you tell your child, do not go into the kitchen. They weren't even planning on going into the kitchen. But now you told them not to. What are they going to do? Go into the kitchen. The law stirs up sin of every kind. And the law of God was given to stir up sin. And where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So when we turn back to Galatians chapter 3. Why the law then? It was added. It doesn't say it supplanted. It didn't say it was greater than. It didn't say it put aside for a moment. It said it was added. And the reason why it was added was because of transgressions. So that transgressions would increase. 
Now notice what it says next. You may or may not have known this. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator. Why are some people so bound as Christians to the Ten Commandments? Why do they hold the Ten Commandments in such high esteem that they even hold it as regulatory over the church today? Why? It was written with the finger of God right there on those stones. Moses didn't have to write it down and give it to the people. It was written by God. What does it say here? It was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, Moses. Did God speak verbally to the nation of Israel face to face? Yes, he did. And what was the response of Israel? Moses, would you please tell God never to do that again? That scared the daylights out of us. So God never spoke to Israel directly ever again. He spoke to them by a mediator. And in fact, the Ten Commandments, it says, was ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Now, if we look in Acts chapter 7, verse 53, we see this being repeated. It says, You received the law as ordained by angels, and yet did not keep it. That's Stephen right before he was stoned. And then if we turn to Hebrews chapter 2, and verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. How did God speak to the nation of Israel the law? It says here, through, the, through angels. How does it say he spoke to us? He spoke to us through the Lord, not through angels. And when the Lord was on the earth, he spoke to men face to face. He tabernacled among us so that we would know him. And he spoke to the disciples directly and promised them that they would remember everything he had said and even more than what he had said, so that it says at the end of Verse 3, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. Not by angels, but by the Lord himself. So what is inferior about the nature of the law? How did God speak to Abraham? Face to face. And when the covenant was made, who was the one who walked between the pieces of the dead animals? God alone. There was a mediator for the law, no mediator for the promise. And notice what it says in Galatians chapter 3. Verse 20, 
Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Now, take out the only since it's in italics and not in the original language. God is one. What does that make you think of? Deuteronomy 6. Do you find that not to be amazing and hilarious? Paul's using the law. He's using Deuteronomy to punch at them. God is one. Is he against the law? No, he uses the law for all of his doctrine. But then says he's dead to it. God was amazing. It's termination. I don't know what you think until means, but I know what I think until means. Until means when it happens, that's the end of it. So it says that until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. Has the seed come to whom the promise has been made? The law was laid down alongside of, added to the promise, not usurping it. It was added until. So it had a beginning and it had an end. That beginning has come and that end has come. The law is no longer regulatory over us. The law was a ministry of condemnation and death because you nor I could ever keep it. Its purpose was to increase sin. Why would you ever knowing you're free from that, want to be under a condemnation of death, a ministry of condemnation and death, knowing that all it does is produce more sin. I want freedom. I want freedom from sin. And only Christ can do that. So where do we see the superiority of Christ? Turn to Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things no prophet was appointed heir of all things through whom he also made the world. No prophet made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. I don't know who you want to listen through, but if I have the opportunity of listening through a man or listening through Christ, I would prefer to listen through Christ. And God in these last days has spoken to us in his son and it has been written in the scriptures. Okay, here, here's where I start thinking of things and I'm going to do an aside right now. Listening to Joshua this morning, talking about J.C. Ryle, encouraging us to read the scriptures. You've been set free from the law of sin and death. Through the law, you've died to the law. In Christ, you've been made a new creation. Do you want to know anything about him? Do you love him? If he wrote you something, would you want to read it? If your girlfriend or your boyfriend wrote you a letter, would you want to read it? Married people exempted? <laughs> Before you were married? Would you want to read it? Oh, I got a letter from my girlfriend. I checked that out tomorrow. No, you opened it as fast as you could and read it because you love that person and everything about them you want to know. Why would you not want to know what's in the scriptures? Now, 
Okay, I'm going out on a limb on this one. I think if you have to be told to read the scriptures or be given a plan, something is seriously wrong. And you are on the verge of legalism because you will read the Bible because you have to. You ought to read the Bible because you love to. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we've read that. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. Man, that's high praise. For a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later, but Christ was faithful as a son. Praise doesn't get any higher than that. Moses gave a faithful and true testimony of what God wanted the nation of Israel to hear. But now that God has spoken in his son, we have a far greater testimony. And the mediation of Christ in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. He has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is the mediator of a better covenant. He is a mediator of a better covenant. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Yes, Moses was faithful as a servant to the old covenant, but Jesus is faithful as a son, as a mediator of the new covenant. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. There is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One mediator. And he is not Moses. And he is not Isaiah. And he is not Jeremiah. He is Jesus and Jesus only. One mediator between God and man. The people who say there are other ways to God besides Christ have thrown their Bibles in the trash. You cannot accept the truth of the Bible and accept any other truth than that Jesus is the only mediator. And the grace of God. John chapter 1. Verse 14 through 17. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glories of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That must have been marvelous. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. But John was born before Jesus. But that doesn't matter. For of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. I don't read the word condemnation there. I don't read the word death. Grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. You will not realize grace and truth through the law. The law is a ministry of condemnation. Now was God gracious in the Old Testament? Of course he was. Was the Old Testament truth 
Sure it is. But grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Going back to where Joshua was headed this morning in Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. The lust of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath doesn't even talk about the Ten Commandments. It's saying what we were by nature. We didn't even have to disobey a commandment. We, we were sunk from the word go. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. If you didn't catch it, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. Not by works of the law. and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So, brother and sister, even we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith and not by works of the law. Since by works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Augustus, top lady, put it like this. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Why will you die? Let's pray. Father, you are amazing. How can we offer you the praise that is due your name as we consider the greatness of your work on our behalf through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ? We pray that we would be stirred to love you with all of our mind, soul, strength, and heart, and to love our neighbor as ourself. In Christ's name we pray. There will be a question and answer time at the end of the service.